Now that Satan has read and understood 1 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8, so go ahead and get that, especially the revelation of the mystery, what are Satan's countermeasures against the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So that is the Bible definition of what a mystery is. It's wisdom that is hidden. Now notice this, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, before the world is created, before Satan himself is created. Now notice verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8 refers to the princes of this world, it's not referring to human beings. It's talking about what Ephesians 6 describes as the principalities and powers, the spiritual wickedness in high places. What 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7 and 8 is saying is that the mystery was something that God hid from all of creation, including the angels, the devils, and Satan, and so on. Now, if you notice what verse 8 says, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The dispensation of grace, the mystery, is such a devastating blow to Satan's objectives that if he had any understanding that the cross was going to purchase the dispensation of grace, then he never would have been in favor of the cross. Now, of course, we understand from Luke 22, verse 3, what does Satan do shortly before the cross? He enters into Judas for the purpose of betraying the Lord, for the purpose of bringing about the cross. In other words, prior to the cross, was Satan in favor of the cross? Yes. He's so strongly in favor of it that he enters Judas because he doesn't trust this human to do the right thing, right? To get the job done, he's going to do it himself. Now, what the questioner is asking, okay, so before the revelation of the mystery, Satan didn't have any knowledge of it. If he'd known it, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But now we're on the other side of it. So now, does today, does Satan know the mystery? Does he understand the dispensation of grace, the purpose of the body of Christ? Yes, he does. And what the questioner is asking is, what are Satan's countermeasures against the body of Christ? In other words, God has revealed the mystery. What does Satan do in response? Get 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now, if you, if you pay attention to a lot of the crazy things people say on radio and on TV and in books, they have the idea that, you know, what Satan does is he possesses people and he, you know, he enters them and possesses them and he haunts houses and causes objects to fly around the room. And he does all this like supernatural hoodly do and so on. But what does the Bible say about what Satan does? First Timothy 4 verse 1 now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What Scripture teaches is that Satan has a doctrinal warfare against the truth. Get 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll look at verse Three. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The idea there is that Satan, as the god of this world, what he does is he blinds people's minds to the truth. He has doctrines of devils. He influences the thinking of the world so that it does not see the truth. Get 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. 
What a wonderful description of what happens when you reject the truth. When you reject the truth, the person that you hurt the most is yourself. That's just how it works. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. The word acknowledge means to admit. Uh, when you admit something, it's something that you know to be true, but you have to choose to admit it. In other words, are any of us ever stubborn? Have you ever? <laughs> well, I better stop there. But are any of us such where we have something we believe and we're in a conversation with someone and they make a point and you realize they're right, but you don't want to admit it. And you don't want to say they're right and I was wrong because we're stubborn that way, right? Well, the idea of acknowledgement is that the, the truth is, is right there. It's, it's present. It's knowable. But what happens is we often resist it. Now, if you notice verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by, by him at his will. The idea there is the devil has snares. In other words, he has traps. He has intellectual devices to capture people and to hide the truth from them. Get 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Now notice this. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In 1 Timothy 3.16, Paul refers to the mystery of godliness, which refers to the body of Christ. The mystery of godliness is the body of Christ that God is forming during the dispensation of grace. Well, Satan is a counterfeiter, and Satan opposes what God does. So if God has the mystery of godliness, what is Satan going to respond with? Well, it's going to be the mystery of the opposite of godliness, which is iniquity. So what Satan does in response to the revelation of the mystery is he has his own mystery, but it's not a mystery of godliness. It's a mystery of iniquity. So let me give you a for instance. Before the dispensation of grace is revealed... How far away does Satan think the 70th week is? Like, let's say you're in early Acts. Let's say you're in Acts chapter 2. How far away does Satan think the 70th week is? Less than a generation, right? If in Matthew 24, the Lord says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, Satan knows the Lord speaks the truth. He knows the Lord never lies. What does he think is about to happen? He thinks the 70th week is going to happen within that generation, meaning the man of sin, the beast will come to power, the mark of the beast will imp be imposed, all of those things. Now I want you to think about something with me. When Israel comes out of Egypt and they prepare to enter the promised land, they send in spies. What do the spies report back? There's giants in the land. We don't want to do this. There's giants in the land. They're way bigger than we are. Why are there giants in the land? The reason there are giants in the land, did God promise that land to Abraham a long time ago before that? Roughly 430 years or so, right? So did Satan know that God, at some point or another, was going to bring Israel into the land? And the answer is yes, he knew that. So when Israel is in Egypt for 215 years or so, 
if you're interested in more on that, we've got a good teaching on that. But what does Satan do during the time period leading up to when God is going to bring Israel into the land? Does he sit there and twiddle his thumbs? Or does he take active measures to prepare for the coming battle? Well, he prepares. And what he does with the giants is he says, I know that Jehovah at some point is going to bring Israel into the land. So until that time, I'm going to build up my forces. There will be giants. Scripture even says there were fortified cities because Satan is preparing for the coming conflict, right? Well, now think about this with me. Acts 2, when does Satan think the 70th week is going to be? Within 40 years, within a generation. Once the dispensation of grace is revealed, does he still think that? He doesn't because it's been pushed off into the future. In other words, is there now more time for him to prepare for what's going to happen during the 70th week? The answer is yes, there is. So is he going to try to make use of that time? The answer is yes. That's why 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 7 says this, for the mystery of iniquity will start sometime in the future when we get close. No, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. In other words, he doesn't know exactly when the dispensation of grace is going to end, but does he know that he now has more time more opportunity to prepare for what's to come. He knows that, and he uses that to prepare. Get with me Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's a fascinating verse. It says that this world has a course to it. If you think of a, a body of water having a course, the idea there is it, it has a path that it flows in, it's in the same location, and it goes in the same direction. Do rivers reverse course and flow the other way? And the answer to that is no. There's, there's, a, a, a way, there's a direction in which they flow. So this world has a course to it. And then you notice here it says the prince of the power of the air. In Paul's writings, there are a lot of maritime or nautical metaphors. Scripture talks about believers being shipwrecked. It talks about people being cast away, right? It talks about them being tossed to and fro, kind of like the SS Minnow for literary fans. The point is that the prince of the power of the air is referencing that Satan controls the winds, the currents of this world, and can influence people accordingly. This is my opinion. You can decide for yourself. In recent years, the term fake news has been popularized, and that term has been popularized because so much of the news is fake. And that is true because the news is full of lies and distortions and inaccuracies and all manner of misleading things. But what I'm going to suggest to you is that the, the, the media organs of this world, the communication vehicles that this world has, it's not simply fake news it's satanic news. I mean, isn't that what it says? It's the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? That's Satan. And it says that he influences the course of this world. Well, how does he do that? He doesn't influence the course of the world by individually possessing people because he doesn't do that. And if he did that, how many people would he influence? Just the one he's possessing. But if he wants to truly influence the world as a whole, the 7 billion people or so that are on it, you have to do it through mass communication, mass media. And, and, and that is exactly what is occurring. Get with me 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. 
1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now the idea here in 1 Corinthians 5 is Paul's telling the Corinthians to put someone out of the assembly because he was engaged in a very grievous sin. What's interesting about this verse is it says, to deliver such an one unto Satan. Well, normally, when you deliver something, you have to have an address, right? In other words, you have to have a delivery address in order to make a delivery. Well, how do you deliver someone unto Satan? What's his post office box? Where does he live? Well, the idea here in 1 Corinthians 5, when it says to deliver such an one unto Satan, what it's saying is you don't have to take the person to any particular place. What you do is if you push him out of the assembly, and I'll call it the safe harbor of the preaching of the word, what, who are you delivering him to? Well, if the prince of the power of the air controls the media, the communication, the thought patterns of this earth, and you put someone away from the safe harbor of sound teaching, what are they going to be influenced by? They're going to be delivered unto Satan, is the idea there. Get with me 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And the idea there is that the world system that Satan has created is full of temptation. Get with me 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. There was a psychological study done that demonstrated that it is easier to deceive people than it is to convince people that they have been deceived. I want to say that again. There was a study done that demonstrated that it's easier to deceive people, to get them to believe something that is false, than it is to convince people they've been deceived. Now, the reason why I tell you that is this. What is the core reason people don't get saved, according to Ephesians 2, 8, 9? Pride. Ephesians 2, 9 ends with, lest any man should boast. If you do a survey of people and you ask them, are you a better than average driver? More than half of the people will say they're a better than average driver. Is that mathematically possible? Is it mathematically possible for 80% of drivers to be better than the average driver? No, it can't be. So why do more than, why do so many people say they're better than average drivers? It's pride. It's self-centeredness. Well, now let's go back to deception. The typical, typical person can believe and accept yeah, there's a lot of deceived people in the earth because there's a lot of dummies out there. And it does not occur to them that they may be one of them. And I'm not talking about intelligence here, but I am talking about deception. Yeah, a lot of the other folks don't know what they're talking about because, yeah, I see that every day. But I know what's going on. Now, when you think about Matthew 24, it says during the 70th week that the lying signs and wonders that Satan produces are so convincing that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Now, re the reason I tell you that is we need to have a bit of humility. We need to have a bit of caution in other words, instead of assuming, well, yeah, the dumb dumbs can be deceived, but not I. That's a dangerous, dangerous attitude. 
because the deception that exists within the world system is pervasive and it's influenced all of us to some degree. Maybe some more than others, but you're probably not thinking about it accurately if you think it hasn't influenced you. That is why vigilance in the Word of God is the only defense you have. If the world system is full of lies, then the only thing that can protect you is the Word of Truth. Daily Bible reading, daily studying, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, Acts 17. Search the Scriptures whenever you get around to it. Daily is the correct adverb. My point is, in terms of Satan's countermeasures, his countermeasures against the mystery are doctrinal in nature, meaning your defenses against his tactics are not emotional, they're not experiential, they're not circumstantial, they are doctrinal. The only defense you have is to get deeper into the Word of God. Now, I'll say one more thing before we move on. 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. It speaks there of reproach and snare of the devil. What Satan loves to do is to find something that the believer does that is wrong and then Aha! Does he have an approach of grace and understanding, or is it accusation? Look with me at Revelation 12, verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Now, this is describing Satan with regard to Israel. But it is also true with regard to the body of Christ based upon 1 Timothy 3, verse 7. Revelation 12, 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accuse them before our God day and night. Now, when you think about the Lord's interactions with the devil in early Matthew and Luke, the devil is referred to as the tempter. Christ was not tempted. Christ did not sin. Do men often succumb to temptation? Yes. So think about what's going on with Revelation 12 here. You know what Satan does? He tempts man. He tempts man. He tempts man. And then if man gives in, he says, ah! It's kind of obnoxious, wouldn't you say? Tempt, 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 and then when man succumbs to that temptation, what does Satan do? He accuses them before God night and day. Well, Satan desires to do the same thing to the body of Christ. What he would prefer is he would first prefer that you change the doctrine. In other words, change the gospel of grace to the gospel of works. Change it to lordship salvation, Calvinism, baptismal regeneration. Change it to anything but the gospel that saves, and he is supportive of that. Because it's the only the gospel of Christ that will save you, according to Romans 1.16. And if he can't get you to change the gospel of Christ, then was he, what does he want to do? Personal attacks. He'd like to be the accuser of the body of Christ.